Greetings, fellow Kerbonauts. Welcome to Kerbal Space Program. My name is Rice, and this is the Minimalist Shuttle Program, Episode 4. So it's time to expand our Kerbal National Space Station by adding in our docking and utility module. And the vehicle that gets this honor is our light shuttle. Weighing in at 10 tons and composed of just 23 parts, this little puppy carries a lot of weight for its size. Its cargo capacity is 4 tons, almost half of the vehicle's entire mass. Now you can do a lot with uh, 4 ton cargo carrying capacity. Uh, however, it doesn't really compare to the real life space shuttle, which had an average max payload of about 27 tons, slightly under that. Um, however, everything in the Kerbal Space Program universe is scaled down. So having a 10 ton vehicle carry 40% of its mass is actually pretty impressive. Now this little shuttle is actually one of my favorite uh, amongst our shuttle options. Uh, mainly because uh, this shuttle is not too big and it's not too small. It's fairly controllable and also it has impressive gliding ability. I found that when I build shuttles, you know, a little bit larger than, <laughs> than they really should be, and we enter, say, the Kerbal Realm size of shuttles, where parts start to jingle jangle and they're not too terribly secure and the physics engine starts to work overtime because it doesn't know what to do when the vehicle is carrying 3.75 meter parts. Um, this shuttle is actually a nice refreshing change of pace to something that seems a little bit more down to earth. As a matter of fact, judging by Jebediah's pleased expression, looks like he agrees with me. Uh, unfortunately, Bill there, being the astronaut cynic that he is, um, doesn't share in Jebediah's confidence. But don't worry your little green head there, Bill. This is the safest and most reliable shuttle in our fleet. Of course, when you think about it, and judging by all the shuttles that I've crashed, that doesn't say a whole lot. Now, an interesting fact about the real-life space shuttle is that it's one of the few aircraft that's actually really susceptible, sensitive, if you will, to lightning strikes. Now, regular aircraft being struck by lightning is really not all that uncommon. As a matter of fact, because its systems are pretty well shielded, when aircraft is struck by lightning, you don't get a whole lot of adverse effects. However, because of the way the shuttle flies and the huge plume it leaves behind when it takes off, when the space shuttle is struck by lightning, it is effectively grounded because it follows the plume trail all the way back down to Earth. Now, because the plume trail uh, provides a current path all the way to the ground, scientists and engineers often worry that this may increase the odds for the shuttle to trigger lightning strikes. Now, it's because of these concerns that NASA has what's referred to as the anvil rule, in that no anvil-shaped cloud, the types of clouds that cause thunderstorms and whatnot, is allowed within 10 nautical miles of the launch site. However, and despite all of these precautions, we are still susceptible to nature's fury. As a matter of fact, when Apollo 12 was launched, about oh, 36 seconds into flight, the ionized plume it left behind triggered a lightning strike. This caused the circuits in the service module to falsely detect overloads. Now this resulted in the system taking offline all three of Apollo 12's fuel cells, in addition to taking offline the majority of the command module's instrumentation. Now as if that wasn't bad enough, nature struck again with a second lightning strike at 52 seconds after launch, which took offline the 8-ball attitude indicator. So with the fuel cells gone, the command service module was forced to run entirely on battery power. So if you think about every malfunction warning light turning on and instrumentation just giving false indications, you could probably imagine that NASA was freaking out about that point. Now eventually they were able to fix all the issues and get those fuel cells back online. Now what's ominous about all of this is that NASA was concerned that the lightning strike might have disabled the explosive bolts that helped to deploy the parachute. And if this was the case, well, the command module would have re-entered the Earth, crashed into the Pacific Ocean, and killed all three crew members. And because there was no way to tell whether or not this was truly the case, NASA thought it prudent not to tell the astronauts about the issue. 
Fortunately, the mission went well, the parachutes deployed, and much to the relief of NASA, everyone went home safely. Okay, and it looks like we got ourselves a nice, smooth launch. Probably one of the smoothest we've had in a while. As you saw with those SRBs, they separated quite nicely, too. Um, if anything, I learned when designing these shuttles and, and during testing is figuring out how to efficiently eject those solid rocket boosters. And because of the way this thing flies, and sometimes those solid rocket boosters have a tendency to strike the wings when they disengage. So sometimes I put in a lot more separatrons than I need to to help eject those boosters as quickly as possible in order to keep the Kerbal safe. Now we've just completed our orbital insertion. We are in a nice stable orbit and we are coasting towards the station. As a matter of fact, we are doing so well that we still have a pretty good amount of fuel in our main fuel tank. So, you know, even though uh, a standard shuttle launch involves us ejecting our main fuel tank, uh, no sense in getting rid of it if we still have fuel to use. So um, this is going to be one of those rare launches where you get to see our shuttle carry the bulk of its launch weight um, throughout the entirety of its mission. Okay, so we did a check of our payload and Fortunately, it is still attached to our shuttle. One of my concerns when launching payloads into orbit is that it's not completely secured in the cargo bay sometimes. And there can be some instances where they jostle free and they have a tendency to rattle around inside of the cargo bay. Fortunately, it is still in one piece and it is still attached to our shuttle. So we are into our course correction burn and look at that beautiful cargo bay. The lights just shimmering off through the inside. It's really a sight to behold and you have one of those curious uh, light bug issues where <laughs> the lights inside the cargo bay uh, tend to shine straight through matter, i.e. the bottom of the cargo bay, and onto the fuel tank. However, I'm not complaining uh, as it is illuminating the entire craft. And no doubt, it'll certainly help us when we start doing our work uh, on, say, the night side of Kerbin as well. Now, this is actually pretty unorthodox, as we are using our launch boosters to perform an interception burn to the station and adjust our orbit. <laughs> um, most cases, uh, when we get into orbit, we eject the tank and also we eject our launch engines. And pretty much the entire flight is handled via our RCS thrusters. So this is one of those neat little instances where we can um, jet along at faster than average speeds uh, in order to intercept the station and also take a few chances as well because, well, frankly, we have the fuel to spare. Okay, so we've done another time skip and we are just jetting along here at an amazing 0.1 meters per second. We're on approach towards the station, just turtling ever so carefully towards it. Now it's important uh, when doing station construction and station work, at least for me, that I get the shuttle as close as possible towards the station and you'll see why in a moment. In most cases, when constructing a station like this, uh, I prefer to stay within as close proximity as I can. And the reason why is to be able to not only keep track of all of your components near the station, uh, and also it helps to construct the station a little bit quicker because when you have uh, the drift mechanic kick in, and when you pick a module out of the shuttle and then realize that your shuttle is now Instead of 50 meters away from the station, it is now 400 meters away from the station. Well, then you have a little bit of a problem. Then you got to make the sprint over there, get the shuttle, redrift it back towards the station, and then uh, play the lap game, <laughs> basically. Go back and forth between the shuttle and try to keep the shuttle from drifting away. However, the techniques I use when I build my stations help avoid that issue, and you'll see that in a moment. Okay, and we are now approaching at ooh, 20 meters. Looks like we're this one's going to be a pretty close interception here. Now I'm going to try to see if I can get it within about 15 meters. So let's jet a little bit closer and time warp a little bit. Okay, and ooh, look at that. Nice. I wonder if we can get a little bit closer. So let's 
etch just a tad bit close. And what we're going to do is we're going to lift the shuttle a little bit higher so that we can face our cargo bay towards the station. This should help us uh, when we pull the modules out of our shuttle and start assembling the top of our station. So let's be careful with our RCS thrusters so we don't over thrust. Okay, and looking good. Perfect, okay. So let's see if we can turn our shuttle about a little bit here. Um, okay, so we're going to bring this in closer than than 15 meters. So let's, let's see if we can get this actually a little bit closer. I want to be able to get it close enough so that uh, we can start putting attachments between the station and also the shuttle. There we go. Okay, now we are in turning range. So let's turn our cargo bay towards the station. And very carefully... Turn us parallel towards them. Good, good, good. Perfect. Okay, now what this does for us is it uh, helps face all our vital components um, towards the area where we're going to be working at. And also, because our solar panel is now facing away from the sun, and it might get in the way, potentially, when we're assembling our component parts, there's no sense in keeping that solar panel out anymore. Okay, Bill, it's time to get to work. What do you say? <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and secure that shuttle then, shall we? So what we're going to do is we're going to head on over towards our toolbox, and this is going to be a demonstration of why I absolutely love the Kerbal Attachment System. It's one of my favorite mods, and it, it, even if I, don't use, if I have to say no to every single mod out there except for one, the Kerbal Attachment mod would be the one that I would say yes to. <laughs> it's just so versatile, and you can do so many things with it, like this, for example. What we're going to be doing is that now that we are close enough to the station, we're ready to start setting up our workspace. And because there's no readily available docking port, what we're going to do is we're going to, in a way, make our own docking port. And what that means is taking on these, uh, taking these pipe endpoints and attaching them from our shuttle over to our station. Okay, and because we like to see Bill do his super speed spacewalk dance, we're going to speed this video up along at five times speed. While we pick up our two pipe endpoints and secure our shuttle to our station. And we're going to drift in just close enough to link in. There we go. Now what's neat about these pipe endpoints is that when you connect them together, it effectively makes them a semi-rigid object. Uh, not just a semi-rigid object, but also a single object that allows you to transfer, transfer fuel and components. However, um, our focus is just to keep those two objects in place. Now I say semi-rigid because there's still uh, the physics engine still plays a little bit wonky with those two vehicles. Um, and so that's why I got the, uh, I decided to pull out those struts to try to add further connections between the two. However, this is the reason why it's important to get as close to the station as possible because <laughs> that shuttle is too far away to use the strut endpoints uh, to connect to each other. So um, I am, I have to resort to using another set of pipe endpoints in order to reinforce the connection between the shuttle and our station. Also, I got to make sure, um, additionally, that the pipe endpoints don't get in the way because ultimately when we pull the cargo out, we don't want it to um, theoretically snag against those pipes. Uh, even though um, I don't think the physics are set in such a way where those pipes are actually physical objects and, um, and I think we actually pass through them, it's still best to take the proper precautions. And now that we've got our vehicle secured, it's time to make sure that we can see what we are doing, because there's a pretty good chance, if uh, Murphy had anything to say about it, that we're going to be working in the dark or on the night side of Kerbin. So we've got our two major work lights attached, and now it's time to get into our assembler module and start pulling out our utility module from the cargo bay of our shuttle. Now, um... Here's the interesting part about <laughs> this utility module is that when those docking doors are open, they press up against the cargo bay. 
Uh, and so this is physics working up against um, the cargo bay vehicle. So I've got to be really careful after I've docked with this module when I yank it out. Because what's going to happen is those doors that's pressing up against the cargo doors are going to fling the module out. And hopefully we've got enough mass on our assembler module to counteract that. Oh, and there we go. Just flying off away from the shuttle. And now we steady ourselves before we fly off into the cosmos <laughs> and realign ourselves back to the station. And now begins this steady and arduous process as we begin lining up this utility module to the station below us. Now this process takes a little bit of patience and uh, while I was recording this I was absolutely focused deep, deep in concentration <laughs> as I was uh, trying to steady myself with just little jets of RCS back and forth. I'm trying to get myself lined up as perfectly as possible. As you can see with the Navy Fish docking mod, looks like we are about as close to perfect as it's going to get. So we bring the module in and perfect, we've got dock. And now we've got our expansion prepped and ready to go. So we open up all the docking ports on this side. And just as I was getting out and getting ready to head back to the shuttle, I then realized, oh, that little attachment down there is where we attach the toolbox to our utility module. And unfortunately, our service module, our assembler module is in the way. So, Bill, you gotta get back in there again and then repark the module someplace else where it doesn't obstruct the place where we're going to be attaching our toolbox. And Compared to docking that module, um, parking this thing really is just a piece of cake. And so we drift ourselves very carefully and maneuver into position perpendicular pretty much to where we were before. And then um, a little bit of a sloppy dock, but we just jet ourselves in. And there we go, nice and steady. And you see that I was pretty liberal too with the uh, <laughs> with the time warping. Okay, perfect. So we are now docked. Effectively, we are just about. This mission is pretty much just about completed. Aside from the fact that now we just need to put in our toolbox. So it wouldn't be a utility module without a proper toolbox. So there we go. Now that we've got our toolbox in place, now um, what's left is just taking apart our workstation. So we go ahead and pick up our lights and put them away. And then we begin the process of disconnecting our shuttle from the station. So we take each pipe and point one by one back to our toolbox. A little bit of tedium involved in this, but you know, it's still pretty important. And we gotta make sure that uh, the toolbox has all the components it came with, because it's going to be useful for when we begin construction work for the more uh, important parts of the station later on. Okay, and we got one more pipe endpoint to go. And in the box you go, Mr. Pipe Endpoint. <laughs> okay, and then time to store up our lights. And because nobody is currently occupying the station, uh, in a way there's really no point in having all the lights on. Um, so. We're just going to uh, pack everything up, make it nice and neat before we head home. And now Bill, our resident space engineer, can take a rest in the co-pilot seat and let Jebediah now do the rest as we get ready to go home. Okay, and a quick time skip later, and we are still in five times acceleration, coming back into carbon, and there's something you don't see every day. <laughs> the shuttle re-entering with its external tanks connected. Um, also doing a cartwheel through the atmosphere. Another thing you probably don't see a whole lot of. <laughs> as you also saw, I jettisoned, I finally jettisoned those, uh, those launch engines as well. Since those launch engines constitute a little bit more than uh, three tons worth of weight, um, it probably would have hindered us uh, on, the glide on gliding back to the Kerbal Space Center. So we need to get rid of that as well. That fuel tank, though, uh, will meet its maker down on the mountains below. Um, interesting fact about uh, the fuel tank. So, um, as you probably already know, the fuel tanks uh, aren't recovered uh, after the shuttle is launched. And it usually breaks apart when it re-enters the uh, Earth's atmosphere. And usually it, it lands somewhere in the Indian Ocean as a result. However, 
um, there was once a concept to reuse the um, orange fuel tank and use it as part of a component in the space station. It was also once conceptualized to have it uh, carry bulk cargo into space. Uh, however, none of that was ever done. Um, it's curious, though, that even though the orange tank was uh, discarded after the shuttle went into orbit, it's still technically usable. Okay, so we are on our glide slope into Kerbal Space Center, and this is another one of those really excellent textbook approaches. So far, we've had an excellent launch, we've had an excellent intercept with the station without any issues, and aside from that really interesting flip we did <laughs> with our shuttle on re-entry, uh, our, our um, landing into the Space Center looks to be pretty good, so it looks like everything is turning out pretty well. Okay. And then we've got our RCS thrusters on as well to help us with our turns and movements, and even though we don't need to use our RCS thrusters. This shuttle is fully capable on gliding on its own without the RCS thrusters. As a matter of fact, about the only reason why I'm using those RCS thrusters is to help empty our RCS tank, and because our lift compared to center of mass is slightly off, um, I built this shuttle under the anticipation that the, the monopropellant tanks would be about half empty by the time we get back. Um, and emptying the, that monopropellant tank uh, um, would help us uh, glide our aircraft a little bit better. However, since we have a fairly almost full monopropellant tank, our lift when compared to our center of mass is a little bit off. But, you know, the shuttle is still surprisingly controllable, so... I'm not really concerned. <laughs> okay, so we're back to regular speed again, and we are coming back. I'm sure Bill is really looking forward to um, coming back, conquering his space sickness once again. And Jeb, um, absolutely happy. Also, probably upset, though, the fun is over, and so he's going to have to wait for uh, the next mission. And so as we make our way towards the runway, I declare this episode mission complete. STS-3 mission complete. We will see you next time.